Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I am Sarah Blaskovich. I'm the food writer for the Dallas Morning News. And today we're going to talk about ghost kitchens, um, a strange word and one you may not be familiar with. And that's OK. By the end of it, you will understand it. Um, and you can ask us any questions you like. Um, I am joined here by Jeff Beckaback. He is a chef, a longtime chef in Dallas, and somebody who I've had the pleasure of knowing and eating his food for many years. Um, Jeff, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, well, uh, right now, uh, I'm a Dallas native, born and raised here, um, and I'm currently the chief culinary officer for Pilf Group, which is uh, Connie Rosso, Zoli's, and uh, Thunderbird Pies, and also our ice cream shop that people were uh forget about Cal Tipping Creamery, which we have a couple of those, so. Yeah, and, and tell us where you've worked before, Jeff, because in addition um, yeah. to making, yeah. you know, some awesome Italian food with Zoli's and with Ira, uh, so we know your food elsewhere. Yeah, of course, so I've been with Jay for um, about two and a half years now, but uh, for nine years previous to that, I kind of did the same role with Nick Badavinas at, um, at Flavor Hook um, and opened all the neighborhood services, Town Hearth, Offsite Kitchen, Montlake Cut, um, tried and true, rest in peace, tried and true, uh, and two neighborhood services in the Omni Hotel, one in uh, Frisco and one in Louisville, Kentucky. Yeah. So it was quite an adventure over that time. Yeah, if anybody has eaten at neighborhood services, which I think a lot of you watching have, um, yeah. Beck had so much to do with those places. Um, Offsite Kitchen was what I believe to be the best burger joint in the city. And uh, it's, it's not Beck's fault that it closed, but he was there <laughs> in its heyday. Um, and then fun fact, I don't know if I've ever told you this, Chef. Um, before I got married, I took my, my wedding pictures inside Tried and True's bar. Are you like serious? That. Yeah, in my wedding dress, there's... No way. Picture somewhere behind me. Yeah, I wore my wedding dress and my, I was wearing like tall, fancy heels and I sat in a booth and drank a PBR and somebody took my picture doing it. No way. Yes. Did so, you know? um, tried and true with my very favorite restaurant at the time. It was on Henderson Avenue. It was not that yeah. very long. No. Um, and when it closed, it was a, it was a big, sad moment for my family. <laughs> yeah, it was tough. That was a tough that, one, but it that was, place is good. it was, it was um, tough. <laughs> okay, so everybody watching, let me tell you how this is going to work. We're going to we're going to define ghost kitchens and kind of explain the business model. During that and a little after, uh, Beck and I are both having food delivered from ghost kitchens while we talk. And one of the fun things about ghost kitchens is that they they can be um, reliable and they can be unreliable. So we are both expecting food between noon and twelve thirty from two places. One is David Chang's uh, fried chicken sando shop. And so we should be getting a fried chicken sandwich with some waffle fries and a drink. Okay. Um, and then we should be getting tonkatsu ramen from Ivan Ramen, um, which just launched a couple of months ago here in Dallas. Ivan Ramen was featured on Netflix show Chef's Table. Um, and Ivan Ramen is a beloved New York City ramen shop. And Ivan, in fact, had a place in Tokyo before he moved back to the States. So uh, we're, I think we're going to eat fried chicken sandwiches and ramen together. Uh, and yeah, fingers crossed. And we're going to show you guys what we're getting um, from these ghost kitchens. So is the food hot? Um, does it taste good? Does it look good? Um, so this will, you know, this is a real life experience of what a ghost, how a ghost kitchen operates. Um, yeah. While you are watching, please eat. Um, I am that one person who's always eating on the Zoom call. I just feel like the food writer in me thinks it's okay, even if it's not a lunch meeting. Um, yep. This is a lunch meeting, and I would love it if you guys would enjoy your lunch, uh, because we're going to be eating in front of you, too. So uh, thank you for joining us. Now, we're going to start with the basics. What is a ghost kitchen? So my simple definition um, is a ghost kitchen is simply a restaurant without a dining room. So this is a place that's making food and selling it mostly via delivery, but also could be for pickup. Um, and you will not go inside and dine. Um, now, they usually happen in two places in Dallas. The first is an existing restaurant. So a restaurant's already there. They're already making whatever kind of food. They decide, we're going to try this other kind of food. But we don't want to sign a lease. And we don't even know if the concept works. Um, in a scenario like this, sometimes people uh, would open a food truck to try it out. Uh, we're seeing now that a lot of companies are then just launching like a second business inside an existing kitchen. And then they, set, they send that food out the door and you order it for delivery or pickup and you get it without um, experiencing the restaurant in person. 
The second place that a ghost kitchen takes place is in a commissary kitchen. This is a commercial kitchen that's almost always in a part of town that doesn't have super high rent. So a commissary kitchen is bigger, it has a lot of space and they can make your food. Um, and it doesn't matter where it is, as long as they can either tell you to pick up from that spot or they can send delivery drivers to send your food out to your home. Um, these are becoming more and more popular and uh, we can talk a little through the business model Beck. but one of the things about the dollars and cents of that is that um, you know you would never open a huge commercial kitchen in a very desirable and expensive part of town say Deep Ellum, Bishop Arts District, Lower Greenville it would be too expensive and the square footage would be too high so a lot of these commissary kitchens are in more far-flung areas of Dallas where you can have a warehouse uh, where there's room and money for that. Yeah. That's right. So that's kind of this this overarching look at ghost kitchens. Um, and one of the reasons why Beck is with us is because the company he works for, the Kane Rosso Zoli's company, opened a ghost kitchen. Um, and they're they're one of the bigger local restaurant groups in town. And um, I do think that they understand the business of restaurants very well. So Beck, um, right. what were some of the reasons you guys decided to open a ghost kitchen? Yeah. Well, first of all, that was a really good description of ghost kitchens for people oh, that don't know. But that was I don't. I don't think I could have done that better myself. Um, uh, you know, when when kind of the, all the pandemic started, we had uh, things were kind of, you know, crazy going. Um, we were trying to figure out what to do. Um, Lee Hunzinger, who's our head PCOLO, pizza czar, pizza genius, uh, myself okay. and Jay had been, um, we had been kind of toying with this idea of doing Detroit style pizzas. I had actually just been to New York um, and gone to uh, Pizza Loves Emily, which is Matt Highland's um, uh, Detroit style pizza place. And Jay's good buddies with him. I had actually never had Detroit style pizza, didn't really know what it was, but had been following him on Instagram and doing some research. And, you know, when everything kind of hit and we had a little of downtime, uh, we, kind of, we started talking about it really seriously. You know, at, at Zoli's, we already do a Sicilian square pizza, which, um, for those that don't know, it, it's similar to kind of a focaccia and um, Detroit pizzas are actually based on a Sicilian style pizza. So we already had the basic bones of, of what a Detroit pizza was. The big difference is, you know, um, the pan that you cook them in and the, and the cheese. So we've been talking about this. I mean, really the simple answer is I just called uh, the pan company that's located in uh, Michigan actually. And just ordered, uh, I ordered 10 pans. I said, we're just going to do this and see what happens. Uh -huh. And um, they sent them in like two weeks. And after that, I don't know, third pizza came out, we kind of said, we have something here. Yeah. You know, and we got to, we have, we have to get this out to the public. We have to get this in their hands. And it kind of started going from there. I ordered um, 30 more pans. <laughs> uh, so we thought we would be able to run a business with um, 40 Detroit style pizza pans. <laughs> and um, which means 40 pizzas at a time only. Yes. Yeah. It, basically. Um, at best, actually, because they're all clean. Yes. At best. Uh, we found out very quickly that that wasn't happening. And now at our, our, our Zola's location in Addison and in Fort Worth, we have 200 pans each at each location. Yeah, okay. So mm -hmm. um, you can see it. It, it, it took off quickly. So that's kind of the basic, um, that's kind of where, where Thunderbird came from. And Beck, the idea is that you can, like I had mentioned, that you could try it. And if people were like, I hate this, or, yeah. or you couldn't keep up with, if, if the cooking, you know, if, if the dough wasn't working or if cooking it was too difficult or if the pepperonis were too expensive, yeah. that you wouldn't have invested all that money Correct. in a bricks and mortar. Yep, exactly. And that, and that was kind of the beauty of it. it. We, for our business model in pizza, it was really easy because we already took elements that we were, we were working on day to day with, mm -hmm. you know, um, with our guys in the building. Um, it, it, that was another big thing. It allowed us to, it allowed us to keep more people in the building to give them more things to do. Um, because once Thunderbird kind of launched and took off and it got so busy, well, you know, it was, it was an easy call for us to be able to, you know, keep those extra two people on the morning to help prep because we need, yeah. we needed them, you know? Yeah. And that's a good point because of the pandemic, right? A lot yeah. of people lost their jobs, restaurants closed or at least scaled back. 
Yeah. And this was an answer to that. You could send pizzas out the door, keep those cooks employed, yep. keep people buying and eating. Correct. It, it, and that's really, you know, I think Jay has described it as we had some downtime. Well, it, we did have downtime, but the downtime was trying to figure out, well, okay, how do we keep these businesses, of, not just keep the businesses afloat, but how do we make them better? How do we, yeah. how do we stay busy, even though we're not as busy? And that's kind of yeah. the ghost kitchen idea for us um, was basically doing R&D for a new restaurant while we were going through regular business operations, which worked out really well for us. Yeah, the timing is good. Mm -hmm. Okay, something just occurred to me and tell me if this seems right to you, Chef. Okay. Um, there's also like an allure thing to ghost kitchens. Yeah. Because they're like another word is a virtual kitchen or a cloud yep. kitchen. And yeah. and so it doesn't really like exist in, yeah. in a tangible way to consumers. Yeah. Does that kind of like secrecy help here? I, yeah, I think I, I, I think that's kind of like, you know, people don't really know um for them to kind of not really know where the food is. And I have a brick and mortar in the traditional sense of, okay, I'm going to drive up, park my car, go in here, talk to the host, sit yeah. down um, and see everything around you and have all of your senses kind of be affected by a restaurant to really just um, kind of uh, leave it to, I, I say, leave it to chance, but like order something that you really don't know what it's about. You've seen pictures, <laughs> yeah. you don't really know where it's coming from. It, it's kind of like this living on the edge, I guess, sense. You know, and, yes. and we we kind of created that first when we when we first started doing Thunderbird, it was only available um, Monday through Thursday, and we started at we were starting at two p.m. Well, those that first three weeks, four weeks, I mean, we sold out in fifteen minutes, twenty. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so, um, and again, that was kinda, yeah, and, and you know, we we were just kind of using we were using some boxes from. Um, you know, restaurant depot that, you know, with the pizza chef on it that says, enjoy your, oh, I know those boxes. enjoy sure. your delicious moments, you know? Yeah. And, um, it was just like, okay, you know, you weren't walking out of Zoli's Zoli's as you know it, or getting something delivered Uber eats with like a branded box. And like, it was, mm -hmm. it was kind of like this weird thing. And then you open it up and it was this glorious pizza, you know? Yes. So it kind yeah. of, drew, it drew people in that way. You yeah. Know? Yeah. I like that. I think that's a good point. Um, okay. So I want to spell out who has been opening ghost kitchens. Okay. Um, Beck makes the most perfect example, which is local restaurateurs have opened them to try out a concept maybe that they haven't tried before. Yep. And uh, one thing I like about this model is that the barrier to entry is low and it means lots of kinds of people could open a ghost kitchen. If yeah. you have a commissary kitchen or can, can, can pay for a low rent for one of those, um, or if you can cook an existing kitchen, or maybe you have an existing kitchen. I just like the idea that we can kind of try out business models, and we've seen other local restaurateurs do it too. Um, and pizza has been a big thing when it comes to ghost kitchens, I think, yeah, because of sure. its deliverability. Of um, but other kinds of people, um, ch big chain restaurants are trying this out just as a new yeah. revenue stream. And in fact, Brinker International, which is based here in Dallas, they own Chili's and Maggiano's. They yeah. started a ghost kitchen called It's Just Wings. And I'm gonna let you guys decide what they sell. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's um, I ordered some and it is quite literally like just wings. And I, I think maybe fries um, and sauces. That's and it you know, arrived on my doorstep, easy. So, so chains are interested in this business model too. And then um, celebrity chefs. So we are seeing like Guy Fieri has five ghost kitchens in DFW. He is not here. I'm sorry to tell you, he is not running those kitchens. Uh, that's not the model and he doesn't have to. He and a team of a lot of people probably came up with a menu and then they sell it here and you can say, I had Guy Fieri's food today um, and he will thank you for the royalty checks later. Exactly. Um, we have David Chang who just launched his um, ghost kitchen. We have Ivan Ramen who uh, we hope to eat his company's food here in yeah. maybe a couple of minutes. Um, so what? let's talk about the, the, so this is interesting that almost any kind of chef or restaurant company can open a ghost kitchen. Yeah. That's a positive. Yeah. Um, but th there are some tricky things about like th these celebrity chefs not being there 
to yeah. follow their food. Um, yeah. And Beck, you've worked at restaurants where you couldn't be everywhere at once. You couldn't be at every neighborhood services. You can't be at every Cane Rosso. Um, yeah. What are some of the worries that restaurant owners have when they can't have their hands on the food all the time? And then yeah. how do you handle that? Yeah, I, you know, I think for the kind of, um, for the, the, the celebrity, the celebrity chef um, kind of ghost kitchen thing, um, those guys have become kind of so famous. They have, you know, teams and teams of people that do recipe testing. Um, they have, uh, they have R and D kitchens, um, you know, guy and David Chang, I mean, David Chang's, you know, international with his restaurants. Yeah. They're used to kind of being, um, the, not being in, in the space. And I think it's a little bit easier for, they're transacting off of their name. Not really, the, I don't think the quality of their food, in my opinion, you know, they're yeah. transacting off of their name and that somebody, just like you said, is like, oh, oh I can have Guy Fieri's food and not be in uh, Times Square or whatever his restaurants are. Or in right. Chang, you know, and I don't know if, um, I don't think people think that David Chang is in Dallas right now frying up chicken, right. but I think that they feel like some kind of connection, you know, when they see David Chang on TV or on well you know, said. Facebook or whatever, exactly right. they, but you know, I mean, I don't believe that, you know, I, he doesn't care. I, I think all that they really care is that they get the check at the end of the month and that's yeah. great for them, you know? Um, so I think it's a little bit different than, you know, the local, local guys like uh, ourselves that are really just, we're, we're, um, we, we want the city of Dallas. We want people to, you know, obviously have good times at the restaurant and have a great experience and have great food. And I mean, it really, um, you know, we work really hard at it and we try to be as many places as we can at once. And it's not just about, oh, well, let's just slap our name on this and put it out there. You know, I mean, we yeah. wouldn't have launched Thunderbird if we didn't think it was a fantastic product. And I don't think that any of these local guys really, um, would do the same thing um, either. You know, I think that they really, it's something that they did out of necessity and that they cared about and it was like fun. Um, and they want to put out delicious food, you know? Yeah. Brinker doing wings, I think it's, I mean, number one, wings are fairly easy. Yeah. And, um, you know, they're very low, uh, they're low cost. I don't even know where would they do it. Are they doing them out of chilies? I don't know. You know, I don't know. And See, that's, that's I mean, yeah, to that's me, that's weird. I don't know. <laughs> these wings just show up at your doorstep truly from, from somewhere uh -huh. you know? it, and that's crazy you know a huge um international company like brinker i mean jumped right in you know yep and if somebody's making uh crispy chicken tenders at chili's i guess that they can just drop some wings too to go i mean that's that's pretty simple but I, i'm sure there's a lot more thought behind it mm -hmm. but, um you know i think that's kind of the idea yeah, I think you're right. So what kinds of food, we talked about pizza, what other kinds of food are ghost kitchen friendly, which, and, and I'll spell out just for anybody listening who doesn't think about the behind the scenes stuff, this food yeah. needs to be to go in a box yeah. and not steam, not ruin itself stuck yeah. in a box. Yep. Um, which like a burger can get soggy or squishy, you know, yeah. Um, this food needs to be able to go in somebody else's car who may or may not care a lot about that food. So can they yeah. just toss it on the passenger seat and does it get damaged? Yeah. Maybe a, um, a wedding cake is a bad idea for a ghost kitchen concept, <laughs> right? That's um, true. Yeah. You know, so there's there's a lot of um, a lot of unsexy behind the scenes stuff that has to sure. come into account before you know you think yeah my my food can go out the door. What yeah. in your culinary background, Beck? Like what kinds of food besides pizza work? Well, you know, um, that's a good question. Number one, you know, obviously not like fish and chips. Probably mm -hmm. like very low on the totem pole um, or seafood kind of in general. I mean, oh, I'm, seafood's a good point. Yeah, that's I'm, personally, I'm not really big on like, I don't think you would want somebody just delivering some, you know, shucked oysters to your door <laughs> that you don't know how long they've been in the car. Of course. Um, you know, I think Nick did a, uh, did a good thing with, um, with his essay pollo with doing his smoked half chickens with kind of tortillas and beans and rice and stuff like that. I think yeah. doing something similar at Jose. Um, I think those like are like big kind of family meal. I mean, pastas obviously travel really well. Um, we, we did, pasta's good. we actually started doing family style pastas during the pandemic at Zoli's and Connie Rosso, shameless plug that you can still get right now that feed four to six people 
and cool. it, and that was something it worked out well because everything traveled well we could pack it really easily um and kind of to your point the other big one of the other things that we probably we didn't hit on but you know with all these third-party delivery companies we put security tags on our pizza and our to-go food mm -hmm. so that way um you know you could you knew if somebody you know popped the top off your pepperoni pizza and tried to take a slice mm -hmm. you know? but we still had you know we still had customers that would send complaints in because their pizza would be stuck to the top of the pizza box because it you know or somebody Just carried it. somebody did this yeah you know and, and i mean and that's the kind of the risk that you take with these third party yes. uh uh um vendors and you know they they clearly know that we didn't you know put a pizza in a box and turn it upside down and hand it to somebody but you know when you're hungry and maybe you're waiting an hour and a half to get your pizza you know you you get you you get hangry you get upset and yeah. you have to get mad at something so we we dealt with a lot of that stuff if people were close we actually would take them a pizza or um have them just run up to the restaurant and have them have it ready so that way they could feed their family uh quickly but um that is the the danger of kind of the third party delivery you know yes well i have a funny story about that um i <laughs> I had heard that Eatsies was offering delivery. And often before I write about a concept, I like to test it out to be sure that I'm not explaining something that doesn't uh -oh, Hold on, my food's here. You have food? Okay, go get it. I'll okay, keep talking. You go he's, get coming, it. he's coming right now. Okay. Um, so I ordered Eatsies delivery to check it out. I ordered a salad one day for lunch. And um, on my doorstep was delivered a beautiful chocolate cake. Appreciate it. So I opened the door and I'm like, and the guy has already left, so it's much too late. And I'm I'm standing there and like, there is my chocolate cake. So I call them and they bring me my salad, but they can't take the chocolate cake back because they've given it to me already. And so that was a major oops during Eatsy's first week of delivery. Um, and you know, it was just a mistake. They just gave the wrong order to the wrong person. Okay, Beck, show us what you got. Okay. And where from? You know what? I don't know where the, I'm not sure where this is from because it just oh. has, well, it has a name on it. and. If you can see the safety safety seal, we've got okay. three of those, which is nice. Good job. The, the driver actually apologized for being late, which was really nice. He didn't have to do that. Oh, that was nice because I think. Um, okay, this is my chicken sandwich. Oh, that's from Fuku. Okay, Fuku, F U K U. Okay. Not a bad word, but it's not. Um, this is David Chang's fried chicken sando shop. Okay, Diet Coke. Oh yeah. Okay. Diet Coke. <laughs> I, I picked some kind of soda for you, Beck. I didn't know what you drank. Okay. Okay, here we go. This yeah. Is, uh, the box here. Let's see what we got in here. That's, that's it. Just a little um, thing there. So we go ahead and unbox this. Oh, this is nice, actually. This is better than I expected. Oh, okay. This is another thing with kind of a big company like David Chang with, I mean, they have uh, branded, um, you know, this is the what the sandwich comes in. Yeah. I did this and then branded a uh, fry holder thing. You did get okay. So the first time I ordered Fuku cut like more than a month ago, I paid for this the exact same thing we got today, Beck, but I only got a, a burger or a chicken sandwich. I didn't get the fries. Oh, really? And I paid for them. So I'm interested to try if mine arrives today, I'm interested to try them. What's my, I mean, it fits perfectly in the box. And then I got, we got a couple of sauces here. And there's um, one is a knockout sauce and one is the Fuku Mayo. Okay. I do not know what those are specifically. Maybe it's interesting you because, yeah, I don't, I didn't know. Um, even on the description on the website, one of them said cream for the knockout sauce, it said creamy, tangy, and savory. And for the mayo, it said creamy, tangy, and spicy. So, you know, two out of three ain't bad. Yeah, I mean, I, it doesn't <laughs> really tell you what's in it. So, um, that's interesting. It doesn't at all tell you what's in it. It's just no. you how you it, might feel afterwards. Yes. And I, they did the same thing with for, for ranch, which I don't really know why people have to get a descriptor for ranch. Okay. Yes. That's not bad. Okay. okay. Bit of a basic, kind of ugly sandwich from here, but maybe uh, I not. Mean, it's, um, it's not cold. It's not cold. Okay, good. No. And um, it's not ripping hot, but. Um, yeah, and that is a Martin's potato roll, which I rather like on a fried chicken sandwich. I think Dave Chang and his people picked a good pairing there. I'm a big potato roll fan. Yeah, me too. Again, that's what the burger that we do at Zoli's is on a potato roll. 
Um, and that burger at Zoli's, for anybody who hasn't had it, is the business. I don't think a lot of people expect to go to Zoli's, a pizza and Italian food place, to get a burger, but you should. It's really good. And uh, Martin's is a kind of Pennsylvania staple, and that's where my parents are from. So I've been eating Martin's for a long uh -huh. time. Um, the fries are extremely cold, but you know, okay. again, that's kind of what you get, I think, on delivery when, when you have uh, fried stuff. Yep. Um, so, okay, these are pretty good, though. The fries are, they're supposed to be. Well, they have a little jalapeno on them. Sweet jalapeno seasoned waffle fries, which yeah. sounds like pretty darn good waffle fries, if you ask me. I, I mean, I like Based waffle. The description. I like waffle fries, but I also think a waffle fry is something that, I mean, obviously it is really good when it's um, really hot, but um, even when it's kind of cold or room temperature, I still like a waffle fry. Yeah. Um, so I'm, me personally, I'm not really upset about that. Um, mm -hmm. And when you order a sandwich or you order something that comes out of a fryer and it's going to take a while to deliver, I think it's... Um, you know, you shouldn't really expect it to be, it's not going to be as hot if it takes a while. To yeah. So you make a good point. And I think we should drill into that a little bit. So when you order delivery food from anywhere, it's, it's a good idea to think about what the circumstances are around it. So I can tell you that Fuku has two locations where they're making food. One is in Plano and one is in downtown Dallas. Yeah. Now, I live near White Rock Lake yep. and Beck lives like in the Lake Highlands area. Correct. So neither of those are super duper close to downtown Dallas. No. And um, they didn't say they wouldn't deliver to us, but your delivery is gonna take uh, probably at least 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And even if they were ripping hot when they went in the bag, which you hope they would be, then they're not after 20 minutes. So yeah. we, we did sort of ask for lukewarm fries without meaning to. Yeah. And that, that's what happens. I mean, you put something that's hot in the box and it steams, it gets mm -hmm. a little soggy. And honestly, like, I think, you know, when for a hot, like a chicken sandwich or something, especially on a potato roll, when you get a little steam, I actually kind of like that a little bit. You know, yeah. I like them like the the bun kind of steams to the chicken a little bit and kind yeah, of- Yeah, I know what you mean. When you open your sandwich and it's all kind of attached. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I also think, you know, like if you get, if you go to any like chicken place or a fast food place and you get a sandwich, I always just get what I want on the sandwich. And I'm, uh, I'm very against trying to like rip the thing open because mm -hmm. I think you, I think you change kind of the structure and the, the taste of it, you know? Um, yeah, the integrity of the sandwich, which 100%. a fast food chicken sandwich does have- integrity depending on where you get it from <laughs> it does I mean, they 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 have their stuff down they know what they're doing are they, yes. so these are the chicken fingers yeah the the, the sandwich we got is the chicken fingers on the sandwich i'm unclear why that seems like you should just put a fried chicken breast but the website um uh identified it as the new fried yeah. chicken finger sando and the new that marketing term totally got me i was of like course. i think we need that Mm -hmm. you always have to have the new stuff the new one right because you can always get the old one whenever but when when you put new i mean it, it's good i'm not really a bit i'm not really big on chicken finger sandwiches because i feel like a chicken finger should be in a basket agree like fries i agree um because you know you get a if you're there's only two chi there's two chicken tenders on this mm -hmm. which, it's okay this if you can tell this isn't that big it's a probably four inch bun so it's uh, not that big but um the proportion of chicken fingers to the bun it, ma it makes sense yeah um, now so, tell us about the sauces that you have and i'm gonna go check okay. my front door in case there's uh -oh. secret food there without somebody pulling up okay the so i've got two of these the knockout sauce um which i'm pretty sure is this one right here it's a little bit more tangy um, it tastes like it has a little bit more chili in there, almost like a little more vinegar. Um, and then just the regular fuku mayo, which is, I mean, it just mayonnaise based. The, these Wait, but like, a spicy mayo or no? Um, it says spicy, but it's the one of these is a little spicier than the other, but I'm not really sure which one is which. Uh -huh. Okay. They basically look like the exact same sauce, but one of them is a little bit more red in color. And one's a little bit more tang tangy. So that's why I'm assuming this is the knockout sauce because it yeah. does taste a little more tangy. Um, so for people who are discerning sauciers, uh, you're not really maybe going to know what you're getting. But both are, both are good. 
Okay. I like both of them. I'm I, like, I like sauce. So do I. I like an, I like an option of sauce. So, you know, it's always good to, especially with fries. It's like, you know, yeah. I'm a pretty classic ketchup guy, but in this situation, it makes sense to kind of have a couple different uh, dipping options. Yeah. You know? Okay. So I'm um, not really sure why they gave you extra pickles. There's already pickles on the sandwich, but. Are they really good pickles? Are they pickles you want to eat by themselves? I mean, they're pretty standard. I'd say dill pickle slices. Okay. Um, yeah. They're a little thicker, but um, they're not. I mean, they taste, they taste fine. I mean, this is. Like pickles. Okay. It's a, it's a good chicken sandwich. It's something a little different, you know? I don't know if it's, uh, I mean, I don't think that David Chang put any magic on these things that's any different than uh, a lot of chicken sandwiches, but it's good. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm going to try to tell you guys how much this costs before we move right. on. Because um, that. that matters. So that bag of food um, total was $27.82. Wow. A lot, a lot of money. It's a lot. Um, and so here's what we've got. We've got a $14.50 meal. So that $14.50 includes sandwich, fries, pickles, two sauces, and a drink. So that's the bulk. Well, that's not the bulk of it. That, that's some of it. Dollar yeah. twenty in tax. Okay. Two dollars fifty cents in a service fee. Just yep. more money out of your pocket for reasons you don't know. Yep. Um, the delivery fee appears to be 49 cents, which is actually very low. And no. it depends on, I think my house had um, a different delivery fee price than your house. Interesting. Right? So can we, you know, we live in different yeah. neighborhoods. Yeah. Um, and then we tipped the delivery driver about four bucks. Well, that's um, nice. So that's where all that comes from. Um, now, uh, that sandwich for fourteen fifty, if you're eating in the restaurant, might be a fine price, but I find it to be maybe a little expensive for essentially a a quick service fried chicken finger sandwich. I agree. Um, but then you add all those fees, and you know we're talking almost thirty bucks for one guy to get cold fries at lunch. Yeah, yeah, and it's good. And I I think if um you know another big thing in my opinion is if there was no um good fried chicken sandwiches in you know, a city of 7 million people, which isn't likely, um, yeah. I, I get it, but you know, there's, there's tons of great chicken places out there. Yep. You know, I mean, there really, yep. really, really is. And, um, and I, I would, me personally, I would rather spend my money with, you know, my buddy Omar over at Whistlebridges or at Palmer's or somebody that's kind of close, um, Ricky's hot chicken, which is incredible. If anybody's been there, um, it is yeah. incredible. They were a guide cover photo. I wrote oh, about how they really? we reached peak chicken. I don't know if anybody yeah. remembers this guide story from a couple of months ago, but yeah. um, our cover art was of Ricky's hot chicken and Richard's. Oh, okay. Sandwich. Yeah. They're, oh, I mean, they're, 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 they're awesome. Uh, my, my side note, my new favorite, I haven't been yet, but S and J chicken. I don't know if you follow them on, on Instagram. Oh. But they are over off Northwest highway. It's one place that I want to go oh. because they do a, like a, a challenge on Wednesdays with like this really place is brand new right keep talking yeah. i think i have food okay they do a challenge on wednesdays that is uh i think it's up to a thousand dollars now and you have to eat three chicken tenders yeah. and uh, in the toast and wow. they they record all of the, um they record all the people eating the uh the chicken fingers and their faces are just on fire and they're crying and you know not very many people complete the challenge. So I, I want to go get over there. I'm not going to do, do that challenge personally. You know, I think I'm, uh, I'm not going to try to do a really it's hot too much pick. suffering. Yeah. It just doesn't look like fun. Yeah. So, um, anyway. Um, so uh, I have two updates for everyone following along at our fun uh, thing here. Um, Ivan Raman uh -oh. says, uh, did you order two orders, which I, I did, one for you and one for me. And they said, oops, we made one. Uh oh. And one is coming and Ooh. the other is 25 minutes behind it. And I don't know whose is whose. So everybody wow. stay tuned to see who gets it first. Um, I didn't get any text messages about the Fuku orders, neither your nor mine. I just got fried chicken. So yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's see if I had a similar experience. Okay. So first of all, this is kind of funny. I have a Coca-Cola. I actually picked a Coke for you, Beck, and a Diet Coke for me. 
and they got yep. flopped. Yep. Um, so I think they just gave this bag to somebody and this bag to somebody, Probably. Um, which yep. happens a lot with delivery. It does. That's why I got a chocolate cake on my front doorstep instead of a salad from ET. <laughs> one time. Not the same thing. I didn't hear that part. Of, I didn't hear that part of your. Oh story. yeah, you were going to pick up your stuff. Yeah, I ordered. Um, they just like gave the box to this driver, and and it was a chocolate cake and not a. I got like the healthiest spinach salad salad I could think of because I was eating at a restaurant that night and I was trying to be a little healthy. And they quite literally gave me like a twelve person big like six tier chocolate cake. Did you eat it for lunch? Um, yeah, I did eat it. I tried to get it back, <laughs> but you can't do that. You I know, can't, like you can't. Yeah. You can't no. be given food and then give it back. And so I I found a way. For, for my family to eat the entire thing and I'm not that's really awesome yeah. <laughs> whoops okay um we won't prolong too much this this uh chicken situation since Beck has already done it but um my sandwich is quite warm and I'm going to do the thing we just said we don't like to do I'm going to look at these two tenders those are actually big those are bigger than those tenders are bigger than mine yeah for sure. my, my my lunch is larger than yours I feel yeah, like I know boarding it over you I know okay um i got fries that were turned on their side but they're okay and let's good. See. oh yeah they are they are colder than lukewarm yeah i'm with you i i can handle a not warm waffle fry it's not terrible yeah um but i it, they'd be better if they were hot much better. Be. of course um oh yeah i've, I've also eaten i've been a lot of um like cold to lukewarm fries out of, you know, at restaurants. So it's kind of, you know, it's uh, just at my restaurants, like, oh, because you got yeah. extra fry there. Let me just eat that. So it's, uh, it's a little more ingrained in me, I think. No, I hear it. I was a waitress in college at a, like a burger and beer bar that was, if anybody's been to the University of Missouri, I worked at the Heidelberg for four years. It is a lovely little place. And I <laughs> ate so many cold fries dipped in ranch in the four seconds I had between you yeah. know, getting pictures of beer and Jägermeister shots to people. Yeah. Great place. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, Beth, while you, I'm going to take a couple bites. Okay. Can you yeah, talk sorry. about um, the, the restaurateur's perspective for paying for third-party delivery? Yeah. Anybody who'd been paying attention might have seen that I've explained that, that you pay, you the consumer, me, I pay for delivery, service fee, tax, and tip. Yep. for these these um delivery lunches today yep and and it was and that you know you calculate that to eight bucks ten bucks yep. for this yep. one order or each of these orders um now that's not where the the dollars and cents stops though because back zoli's and Kane Rasso and thunderbird pies are also footing some of this bill so so explain to consumers who don't know how that works from your end yeah so we um we basically pay a fee every time that you order through Uber Eats. We're, Uber, we're exclusive to Uber Eats because we actually got a, a, a better percentage. Uh -huh. It wasn't great. Um, but since we went exclusively with them, they gave us a better percentage. Um, you know, they send you kind of an iPad and all the, all the, the gear, which is really just an iPad and a link um, so people can go on and order through the website. Um, but we don't that 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 money comes right out of the bottom line for us. We don't charge extra for Uber Eats deliveries. Uh -huh. um, so all those all those fees or some of the extra fees and stuff that Uber charges us, we don't pass that on to the customer. Otherwise, you know, this would probably be what did you say it was a twenty one dollar sandwich or something like that? It's fourteen fifty for the sandwich. Or the whole added thing. all kinds of stuff on top. I mean, of it. the whole thing together would probably be another three or four dollars if yeah. we added on fees to all of our, our stuff. And then, you know, um, I mean, I told you this a little bit earlier. I mean, we got our end of year Uber um, kind of uh, report and we paid them a million dollars, a little over a million dollars this year, just in fees. Um, wow. between all of the Connie Rosso's and Zoli's um, that went directly to Uber. Okay, guys, one more time. The Connie Rosso, Zoli's, Thunderbird Pies companies paid out $1 million to Uber Eats for delivering their food in the last year. That so, is a lot of money. Yeah, that's a lot of money, which that is the big argument for third-party um, deliveries. Uh, now, I mean, we did obviously have an increased amount of sales um, 
that we wouldn't be able to do on our own because we can't hire, um, you know, 10 drivers Mm -hmm. for us and have them go out in their own cars and, and and deliver pizzas for us. And I think this is liability problems. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot, I think there's a lot of things, you know, people have to provide their own transportation, the Uh liability problems. And then, you know, how do you negotiate the gas? What's your, what's your delivery range? There's just a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, And it becomes, it becomes difficult. And at the time when the pandemic hit, we just, there's too many, that's too many things to figure out in a short amount of time. You know, when, um, when people just want to order their pizza on a Friday night and they have no other way to get it, yeah. um, you know, it's not like a restaurant. You can't just say, okay, cool. We have five servers here. You guys just hop in your cars and start delivering pizzas. Now that's not really how it works. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so I think that, I think that the third party deliveries are here to stay. I think that um, okay. people want to pay for convenience. I think a lot of people don't understand um, that it's, it, it, it is difficult for restaurants. And I'll just tell you like these big companies like Uber, they give us a better rate because we have more businesses. I mean, that's a million dollars. You're more between, useful to them or more yeah. profitable for them. But some of these smaller businesses, their percentage is higher. And really they can't, that, that, that makes it much more difficult for them to operate because they get stuck in this, well, do I do, you know, do I do Uber Eats? If I don't do it, is that business still going to come in? Uh But if I do it, will I get, you know, will I increase my delivery range and find new customers almost like part of a marketing budget? Yeah. Am I going to break even on this thing? You know? Yeah. Um, Because if you're selling, if you're selling something small or that you already have pretty thin margins on, which most things in, in the food business, the margins are already small anyway. Yeah. What, what, what's your, what are you willing to do? You know? Yeah. And related to that, yes, maybe you meet, get new customers and those restaurants don't make a lot of extra money by partnering with these third-party delivery groups, but maybe they get new customers, but they also might upset those customers. Yeah, those correct. Customers thought they were getting hot waffle fries yeah. and they got them 20 minutes late cold yep do they are you going to order this again and is it is it good enough yeah and here's another big thing that people don't understand and it's very hard to explain and i'll just put it out there for the people that are listening so when you order through i just keep using uber eats because that's who we use when you order delivery if something is messed up on the on the order or you don't get your order or something happens you know um you place the order through uber's website not through Connie Rosso or Zoli's. You pay through Uber's website. Uh huh. When something's wrong, people will call the restaurant and say, "This happened. This happened. This happened. Can you, you know, this pizza wasn't right? We can't give you a discount. Right? We can't give you your money back right away because you didn't yeah. pay through us. You paid through yeah. Uber. So when we tell people you have to contact Uber and we'll approve it and ask for, um, you know, your money back or whatever the situation was." A lot of people get frustrated because they think that we're lying to them. But honestly, the we're passing the buck. Yes, and when you when when you pay for Uber Eats, that that money doesn't go magically through Uber directly into <laughs> your know, bank account right away. It, it it doesn't. So people get frustrated with that, and that really is the truth. And so it it, it brings up uh, some other customer service issues. Um, Good point. That, you know, of course, people wouldn't understand. And I don't, we wouldn't expect them to understand, Um, but it is tough on a Saturday when, um, when somebody wants to get, you know, four pizzas for their family pizza night and something happens and they're frustrated and um, because it happens, it it does happen. The other thing is too, just like if you get an Uber home somewhere, you might be waiting for a guy and the guy might just be like, oh, cancel. And then you have to find another one. Well, the same thing, the same thing happens with the drivers. They might they might not just, you know, want to pick, they might want not want to drive to the restaurant or whatever. And they also try to pick up, um, you know, they'll try to pick up more um, orders than they should sometimes. Yeah. We've seen that too, where um, have you ever, like, if you're watching them, them come to you and you're like, why are you stopping wherever? And it's like, because they took my fuku chicken maybe and they stopped at your house first 
and yep. then they stepped in my house or whatever it may be. You know, yeah. so that's um, it is the these are the prices you pay as the consumer too. Yeah, and you can't blame them because they're that's how they're trying to make money do that doing uh-huh. their thing. So they don't want to you know they don't want to drive to Fuku once for one chicken sandwich and then drive back for another one and drive back for another one. So it, I mean you can see there is a whole web of like all of these things. There's not one answer or one silver bullet yeah. to figure it out, you know? Yeah. And that's why a lot of people say too, it's like, well, why don't you just deliver it yourself or fine? I mean, you know how hard that is? That's not, it's not mm-hmm. that easy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so um, it, there's, there, there's going to have to be a better answer, but I think now that we're, things are calming down, I think smarter people than me are going to start to figure it out a little bit, uh, a little yeah. bit. I, I think you're right. We will be talking about food delivery for a long time. Yeah. And it, it, I do think it will get better, um, but it, it will be part of these business models. I want to mention one thing and then I'm going to go to the questions because we have a bunch. Okay, um, cool. Ghost Kitchens did not come about during the pandemic. Correct. They didn't. We had no. Ghost Kitchens in Dallas and there are some good examples. If you'll click on that story and read it, there's some good examples of ones that popped up in 2017. There was a, a pizza place um, or like a buffet pizza place in Deep Ellum called Stone Deck Pizza Pub that has since yeah. closed. And they were selling like gourmet mac and cheese and only mac and cheese out their back door um, via Uber Eats. Very Which interesting. Really interesting. Yeah. So um, now the pandemic um, exacerbated might be a verb. People, you know, the, the need for a ghost kitchen. Um, it also dramatically increased uh, business and it caused companies like Bex to decide to open one. So yep. we have a lot more ghost kitchens than we used to, but I don't want anybody to get the wrong idea that this was an answer to the pandemic to get food on people's doorsteps. They yeah. already existed and models were already there. And then um, entrepreneurs greatly accelerated their um, presence in cities like Dallas so that people like you could spend this money on delivery and everybody could make money out of it. Yep. Um, and serve a need, of course. Okay, yep. uh, there's a question about the chicken sandwich and I love this question. Um, uh-huh. How does it compare to the Popeye's uh, fried chicken sandwich? Which I have waited in, I have waited for hours for that sandwich when it first came out in several drive throughs including a couple of times when I waited and didn't get one. Yeah. Um, I'm highly familiar with this Popeye sandwich, but Beck, I want you to answer first. You know what? I, I don't know, because I haven't had the Popeye sandwich. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> this is like my part-time job for a little I, bit when this uh, I, sandwich I, came out. I, okay. I, I, I found it crazy that people were waiting in line for, I should go get one now. And I should have done that it's, before I got this because now it's easier to get, but I yeah, thought that was crazy. If it were not my job, I probably would not have waited so long because while I like a fried chicken sandwich, it is not a deep, deep passion of mine. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that the Popeye's chicken sandwich is better than the Fuku sandwich. It looks better. So it, yeah, it, um, First of all, you get it steaming hot. Second of all, Popeyes kills it with chicken. Their chicken is so yeah, good. Uh, is. I'm just like Popeyes anyway, if I can be honest. Um, but they I do, do like have Popeyes this, in general. I like it's Popeyes. Good, right? It, yeah, I like. Um, they have a spicy um, mayo, I think it is, on Popeyes sandwich that's probably similar to the Spooku sandwich. But I want to say Popeyes uh, fried chicken sandwich costs you five bucks. Yeah. So five dollars, and you get in your own car and you get it your own gosh darn self. Yeah. Uh, or twenty seven dollars to get it delivered to you and have fries that aren't hot. Yeah. You know, you, that's, that seems like a no brainer to me when if yeah, you need to pick one. I agree. Um, okay. Uh, tipping delivery people. Yes, it is a good idea to tip your delivery people. It stinks that you have to pay even more money after paying tax, service charge and delivery, but you do have to tip your delivery drivers. And my suggestion would be if it all seems too expensive, don't, don't order. Yep. I would not stiff your delivery drivers. It is not their fault that this is costing you so much. It is That's what true. I consider to be the cost of doing business. Yep. Um, I believe a tip of 20% for a delivery driver is fair. Um, you know, you decide where you're comfortable tipping. What do you think about that, Beth? I think I, I agree with you 100%. Okay. Um, because that that's the way that they are making making their money. And, you know, you, you've, you've chosen, you've chosen to yeah. do a delivery or pickup. So, I mean, it's, that's, you have to, uh, you have to tip your service people. Yeah. Uh-huh. You know? Um, okay. Another question. Do we expect these ghost kitchens to grow plateau or fade as we resume to the new normal? What do you think? That's a, that's, that's, that's a really good question. Um, 
I think that, uh, I think that, you know, I think there's always, I think there's always going to be a way for people to, um, I, seeing this, if you have an idea of running a ghost kitchen out of your already existing restaurant, um, I think people are going to continue to do that. I also think that, um, you know, the other idea of having like a big centralized kitchen where people might have an idea and that they can go start up a new business for rel relatively low um, like entry costs. You don't have to pay yeah. for a building and a restaurant. You can give it a run for six months, eight months, nine months and see if it works. Mm -hmm. um, that that really that really is way, way better than, um, you know, really committing to opening a restaurant, doing a building. There's so much money that goes into it before you even really put the product out. So I think it's going to continue to, um, I think it'll grow just in a different way. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I don't think they will fade. One thing though I will mention is that, um, and you'll see in this story, if you read it on dallasnews.com slash food, is that um, ghost kitchens are much more unreliable than, than brick and mortar restaurants. And they can be, right? If they run out of food, they don't have to, they don't have to continue to stay open and, and hire a hostess to stand at the door and apologize to people like you would have to do at a restaurant. They yep. just turn off their website and send people home. Yeah. And you might be out of luck. Your, your food might be refunded. You might wait an hour and then you don't get your food at all. Um, this is not the norm. I'm not suggesting that, you know, they, that ghost kitchens are always unreliable, but they are a totally different um, level of reliability than a restaurant, which no. if it says it's opening Saturday at 11 and stays open until Saturday at 11 p.m., they, they've promised you that. It's on their website. It's on Google. And, sure. um, and ghost kitchens just really don't work that way. So um, that can be sort of a trouble spot. I think um, it's like the, the phone game too. There's just, when you go to a restaurant, when you look at your server and order the food and then they go back and put it in, there's just less people. There's less people, uh, like there's less in between. Talking, yes. You know what I'm saying? There's so. There are um, less, fewer variables. Where there, things yeah, things way, way fewer var variables. So yes. You know. Yeah, good point. Um, okay, oh, one question, Beck, that somebody hasn't, nobody's put this in the chat, but I'm curious. Um, not speaking of the restaurants you've worked at specifically, but speaking generally, how much does it cost to, you know, uh, open a restaurant? I've heard quarter of a million dollars, half a million dollars. Are those right numbers? Um, a, a, lot, a lot more than that. Oh, shoot. A, Clearly, a I've never opened a restaurant. You guys. Yeah, that's, <laughs> um, that will get you... Uh, I mean, it just really depends on the size of the restaurant, but you know, I mean, I would say um, 800 to a million on, hey. on um, is probably a good, good guesstimate for like, you know, a full service, call it 3,800 square foot restaurant from mm -hmm. if you just have a building that has a grease trap in it. Yeah. Okay. That's and, wow. I mean, you could do it for less. You could do it for less, but I don't think you could do it for two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. Yeah. You know, okay. Good. Contractor Good. fees and you know all the stuff building out and and opening inventory. I mean, it costs twenty-five thousand dollars for the POS system to get set up in a restaurant. You know, Ooh. for to, just to ring the food in. Yeah. Wow. So. Okay. Good. Good insight. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, Errol wants to know the little bit of food scoop or question here on, on Cane Rosso. Okay. Are we going to see a Cane Rosso in West or Northwest Dallas like s &J did for hot chicken? West or Northwest Dallas? Um, oh, West or Northwest Dallas. Yes. I, no, I don't, I don't know. Not right now. The next Cane Rosso we have, I mean, we just opened a Cane Rosso in Arlington, which I know that's not West Dallas. Um, but the next Kane we have right now is about to go under construction at um, Hillcrest and Arapaho. So that's North okay. Dallas. Yep. Um, but I'm not going, to, we're, uh, we're looking at a lot of places right now. So West Dallas is not out of the question. Okay. The Northwest Dallas is not out of the question at all, at all. So. Can you give us an update on the Thunderbird Pies too? We So yeah. just to recap, yeah. Thunderbird Pies is the Detroit style ghost kitchen, but it, it has legs and there will be a brick and mortar Thunderbird Pies. And the first yeah. one will be where? Um, so it's going to be in East Dallas, right next right next door. It's actually going to share a wall with uh, Connie Rosso on Gaston. Uh-huh. So um, we are also opening Cal Tipping Creamery with the Thunderbird Pie. 
in the same building. Cal Tipping is our soft yeah. serve ice cream place. And we do um, stackers, which are kind of like Sundays. It's all, it's awesome. We do a ton of like homemade toppings, brownies, blondies, funfetti cake. Um, we also do dip cones, which is my personal favorite. Oh yeah. Uh, and milkshakes. But the, uh, the idea with Thunderbird, Thunderbird is not going to be a full service restaurant. It's going to be a counter service restaurant. Okay. Which we'll focus on, we will have, uh, we'll, we will have a small dining room with tables, uh, probably some cool video games, uh, some pinball, oh, some old school Pac-Man, like it, it's going to be fun. Um, but the idea is to, um, to be able to come in and grab a pie and sit down or be able to order it, um, and get it delivered. So it, it's yeah. the, the, the Thunderbirds travel so well, we wanted to get into Dallas to be able to expand our delivery range. Yeah. Uh, nice. So that's well, what we focus on there. For parents like me listening, I have a one-year-old and an almost five-year-old, um, Thunderbird pie sounds good because ordering at the counter when you got kids with you is good getting your food quickly is good when you have yes. kids. Beer is good when you have kids with you. <laughs> we will have that. We'll have beer and um, wine there. Yes. And then uh, the ice cream, you know, like my daughter has had cow tip and creamery before. It's good stuff. Um, yeah. So people, East Dallas folks like me, you'll, it's, this is a place you should take your kids or your grandkids. And people ask that they're like, are, are you sure you want to open a pizza place right next to a pizza place? But you <laughs> yeah. know, Rosso is, it, they're so different. You know, I, I think it's it's great kind of synergy because, you know, I mean, if you're a real like pizza crazy person, you can go to Kane on Tuesday and go to Thunderbird on Wednesday mm -hmm. and ice cream both days. I mean, if you want to. So um, I, I think it's a great idea. And for us to be right next door to, um, you know, our sister restaurants can be fun. Yeah, totally. OK, a little bit of a lightning round. We've got a couple okay. of minutes here left um, okay. and I want to make sure I get to as many of your questions. Um, several of you asked. Like, what are your favorite ghost kitchens in town? Um, I'll name a couple. And then, Beck, if you have any um, that you want to okay. mention. Okay. So um, I I like Thunderbird Pies a lot. I yep. like Big D Pizza, which is uh, which is Detroit Tile Pizza over here in East Dallas, too. Um, I like the idea of TLC Vegan Kitchen. Um, I have not tried it yet because they're doing pickup only and not delivery last time I checked. Um, and I love the name of furlough burger or furlough brothers, sorry, yeah. which started, you know, during the pandemic and is a pickup only ghost kitchen in West Dallas. Yeah. Um, I, I will be real honest that, um, I, I love the new business structure here, but my family does not order a ton of food via third party delivery because I know a lot of the money 25 to 35% does not go back to the restaurant. It goes to the third party delivery company. That's and good. I just, my family of four finds delivery food quite expensive. Yep. So we do a, a lot more driving to a restaurant, picking it up and taking it home. Or in the throes of the pandemic, we were a crazy picnic family. We took, I had a quilt in the back of the car all the time and we had a baby and a four-year-old and we'd just go someplace and throw out the blanket if the weather was nice and eat our food close to the restaurant without going indoors. Yep. Uh, so those are, those are my suggestions. What do you think, Beck? Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm kind of the same way. Um, I'll just, going off of that, if you look on, and a lot of people don't know this too, on the Uber Eats website, you can actually order pickup through the restaurant and there's no fees associated with that. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so yeah. you can, and if you don't want to call the restaurant or you get on, for us too, you can order through Uber Eats and not have it delivered and it'll just pop up and you can come pick it up, which is actually better for us. Yeah, sure. And better yeah, for point. any restaurant. So for anybody who wants to think about how to help a restaurant while also ordering their food, takeout and pickup is a better option than this third-party delivery. Um, yeah. Yes, great point. Okay, so, um, so as we wrap up, I will ask, we'll answer a couple more questions, but I just yeah. want to update everybody. Neither of us got our second order of Ghost Kitchen food, which was due at 12.30. It is 12.59. We were both supposed to get a bowl of tonkatsu ramen. Yeah. I believe we will both get this. Uh, who knows when, though? So. Yeah. Something to keep in mind, you know, in this very real life um, test yeah. is if you're looking to eat food at a specific time or even with other people, you're not necessarily guaranteed that. Um, and I'll tweet about it afterwards if my food is hot. Yeah. Um, so and <laughs> Beck's on Twitter, too. I'll put yeah, I'll post I'll post it if I uh, if I actually get it. At some yeah. Point. OK, good. Um, so we're going to answer a couple more of your questions, but I just wanted to say thank you to so many of you for joining us. 
Um, go to dallasnews.com slash food and find that story. That has more recommendations of both local and national companies doing ghost kitchens. It explains a few more of the pitfalls that we didn't get into. Um, and I just hope this was helpful for you guys. Please email me or, or tweet me or find me any way you can. Um, if you have other questions about styles of um, restaurant business models that you don't understand or that you're curious how popular they're going to be because I love to dig into these and to explain them to you um, and to find an expert like Beck who knows more about it than I do. Um, so I'm so grateful for you guys. This is a, an awesome food community and it's a, it's a lot of fun to talk with you. Do you have food, Beck? No, I thought I did. I thought I had somebody pulling up okay. here. Yeah, I, I thought I did. But Okay, a uh, couple uh, more questions for you. Um, Oh, this is a good one. What risk are chefs at with authorities for running ghost kitchens from their homes? Um, you, they're, they're, well. You can't do that, right? You can't. You can't have a full service restaurant um, out of your home. Like you couldn't, you couldn't just make a bunch of fried chicken and send it out to somebody. You can't, that's, that's illegal. There are some new laws when people are making things like jams, jellies. I, I don't know all the ins and outs of that. Uh -huh. But I would be, I'd be very wary of ordering anything from somebody's house in bulk because, you know, at restaurants, we just have way better ways to refrigerate stuff and make sure things get back to safe temperatures um, quickly. So, and the health inspector visits those commercial businesses to make sure they're complying. There's, yeah. there's a lot more to it. Yeah. Yes. There's a lot right. of things that we pay the city to make sure that everybody's safe. Yes. Um, are profits from ghost kitchens part of a long-term business model or a short-term quote, let's see what we can do here kind of thing? Well, that's a good, I mean, that's, a good, I, I think it's both. I mean, I think it just, um, it depends on who's doing it. You know, if it's like the furloughed chef guys, which I don't know, but like if somebody is renting out a, a building and like what we talked about before, maybe they have an idea and they want to see how it goes for six, eight, nine months. Well, I mean, then they're betting on themselves that maybe they're going to get the money together. They find that they're doing the R and D and then they can open a brick and mortar. I mean, for us, it was to find another stream of revenue uh, of something different and have something to talk about and to keep us busy. And now it's turned into, I mean, the idea was honestly always to turn it into a brick and mortar and another style of pizza. So that was our end, end goal. Yeah. 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 Which I think might differ some, some, especially the ones who are renting a space in a commercial kitchen, they may never plan to have, a standalone restaurant. Although I do think that any restaurateur with a successful business model would be crazy not to try to find investors and create a real restaurant brand if they do find success. That's I, the dream. I yep. I agree. I mean, it's just like, you know, it's kind of like being a wildcat or you kind of hope, hope, yeah. you, hope you strike that oil. And, you know, if it's, if you're going to make a bunch of money or it's done well, then that's great, you know, but if not, then you got to move on to the next thing or try to find, do something else. You know, and um, I think the low risk of going into these um, commercial, these big commercial kitchens is just so great for people um, yep. because it teaches them some operational stuff. And there's a lot of people with great ideas, but, you know, it's only a great idea if, if people buy it. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like that's, yeah. that's it. So, yeah. Uh, um, okay. One more question. Um, yeah. Beth Ann asks, uh, are there, I'm not seeing it pop up, but the, the question was basically, is, is there a, um, a map of where all these are? And the answer is no, um, not that I know of, but no. the, the way you find them, first of all, through me at the Dallas yeah. Morning News, if you like, we write about a lot of them, um, but also, and my, my colleagues do as well, um, but the Uber Eats website, DoorDash, Postmates, Grubhub, Caviar, are kind of the big third-party delivery companies. And then, yeah, you want to check with your local news outlets to see what the smaller companies are. Not all of them are on those big platforms. Um, but we, Instagram is a, is a kind of a, a hotbed for where these brands pop up and advertise right. themselves. I'm always uh, trolling Instagram, looking for new food brands and trying to figure out where they are. Um, but yeah, if you'll follow us at dallasnews.com, um, on Twitter at DMN food or follow me as Blaskovich, um, and then use your apps to find the places that you like. But as you can see, this, this business model is, is slippery and tricky and no, there's not like one easy hub where you can find everything that you want. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. 
on that note, we're going to sign off. I have good news that ramen was just delivered to my doorstep the second okay. that we're signing off. So um, we will end the call here. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, go find us on Twitter at Beck Texas. So B-E-K-T-X. -E yep, that's it. B-E-K-T-X. That's it. Or at S. Blaskovich. That's hard to spell. Just do your best and you'll find me. <laughs> um, and we'll tell you how our little ramen adventure was afterwards. Thank you again. I hope this was useful and I look forward to talking to everybody again soon. Thanks, Beck, for joining us. Thanks, so much. Thanks Sarah. That was fun. Okay. Y'all have a great one. Bye.